afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the eighth installment of Lunch Bites with Steve and Jane. My name is Sam Holliday. I'm the Director of Operations and Scholarship here at the United States Capitol Historical Society, and we are so glad you took the time to join us today for this special program. Uh, we know that time is a really valuable resource, and we appreciate your willingness to share some with us as we talk about really fascinating chapters of Capitol history. Uh, so without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Jane Campbell, the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society to kick things off today. Jane? Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our, our ongoing series about Capitol Hill neighborhood. How did it become what it is today? And what are the stories behind the activities? Um, we have today our illustrious guide, Steve Livengood. 50 years he's been guiding people around Capitol Hill, uh, in the Capitol, through the neighborhood, and has learned stories more than we can ever imagine, and we're so grateful to have him on our team. So Steve today is going to talk about Capitol officials, Square 688. Who are the unknown heroes of Capitol Hill? Steve, the floor is yours. Okay, so there's the cover of the book, uh, Creating Capitol Hill, where most of this information comes from. Okay, we'll start out with the maps as usual to show you uh, over time what this location was. The uh, blue cross is the intersection of First Street and what is now Independence Avenue. It was B Street at that point. And, um, and then the square to the just upper left of that with the orange arrows is what we're going to be talking about. Um, this is what it looked like in 1801 uh, from the Don Hawkins map that we talk about each week. And you can see First Street hadn't even been cut through to independence yet. The, the stones were in place, but uh, uh, the, the streets had not been um, uh, created yet. Here's the Latrobe map from 1815. The square is still there, and this shows the buildings that were there, just the, the brick ones. Uh, it didn't indicate the wooden ones, so we're not sure what, uh, what was there uh, in between these brick buildings. So this is what uh, Latrobe drew after the British had come through and burned buildings. But you can see um, none of the buildings are hollow, uh, which means none of them had been burned by the British. Um, then this is where it is today. This is the, the um, Google map. Uh, and you can see the block is gone completely uh, and it's part of the Capitol grounds. And then here's the satellite map uh, of the same location. So that's what we're gonna be talking about is that block. Now you can see on the 1801 map, uh, there's only one structure there and it looks like it's not uh, uh, completed yet. But these are the people that we know uh, lived there. Uh, Stephen Hallett, whose name in French was Etienne Hallet, uh, was the man who thought he was gonna get to design the Capitol building. And uh, uh, William Thornton came along with a design that George Washington liked better. And so they compensated with Hallet uh, with being the construction superintendent. And so he was the first person to, to uh, be offered a place there. Um, James Mathers was the doorkeeper of the Senate, uh, and I'll explain why the doorkeeper of the Senate was living on the House side. Thomas Claxon was doorkeeper of the House, and Thomas Dunn was assistant doorkeeper of the House. And then we'll talk about later owners uh, on this block as well. Now, uh, to understand a little bit, you have to see these two red squares. These are the matching squares in front, and I talked about the upper one several weeks ago because that's the one that uh, Daniel Carroll of Duddington retained all for himself, and then the British came along and burned all of the buildings. And so all of those buildings are hollow. Uh, that's square 687. Square 688 is the one we're going to be talking about, the lower red square. And um, uh, the Congress retained all of this. They had traded with uh, Duddington. Uh, he got all of the block above, and the Congress took all of the one below. And that is why the Senate doorkeeper was living on the House side is because this, they had given away uh, the same location on the Senate side. So they just put all of the officers of the House and the Senate to live on this same block. Um, we don't know exactly what happened. It may be the officers had to build their own houses on lots that they were allowed to use. Uh, that's the 
probable situation, but this is what it looked like in 1815. Now, looking up closer, um, the I, people that we've identified here, we know that uh, um, James Mather lived, Mather's lived, um, I forgot to plural his name there. Um, the doorkeeper of the, of the Senate lived in that, uh, uh, in the house with a green arrow. Uh, Thomas Claxton, the doorkeeper of the house, lived in the, in the one with a blue arrow, and that the yellow uh, arrow is the stables uh, that probably was there for, for uh, everyone who lived on the block or anybody that wanted to. So let's go back and talk about Mathers. Mathers was a doorkeeper and sergeant at arms at the Senate. He was an Irish immigrant uh, who had been severe, severely wounded in, in the Revolutionary War, and he'd been doorkeeper for the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, so he moved down here. Um, we think he lived in this largest house on the block, and, and that that house may well have been built by the Congress, but certainly he was able to use the ground rent free, and that uh, we know that he used the garden for subsistence, and so uh, it was uh, quite a large lot. He would have moved into the houses that Latrobe had planned um, if they had ever been built. And that's what this uh, is. This is, um, this is what Le uh, Benjamin Latrobe had proposed. Now, the, the block that we're talking about is off to the right of the upper uh, picture there. Uh, and Latrobe proposed building two houses below the Capitol. Uh, and he has modeled this on the propylia at the... the um, uh, Acropolis in Greece, where you had to come through the gatehouse in order to get into the temple. And so he's proposing the same thing here as a way to deal with the, with the uh, steep hill, is to put the entrance over there and the doorkeepers are right there. Now I showed, the, showed you this um, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, to show you the, the drawing on the bottom, which shows you how steep the hill was even above the capital. And this is why they had the problem with drainage of water into the capital and why when Daniel Carroll built his houses at the top of this drawing, uh, they were way above the capital. And when they cut the street down to the level of the capital, that left Carroll's houses way up on a hill. And all the houses around the capital had that problem. So the, the uh, blue arrow on the top drawing shows you what uh, Latrobe had proposed, but that was never built. We do know that, um, that uh, Mather's widow continued to live in this block. Here is where Mather's widow was, uh, where Mather's was living in 1811. We think he may have been living over here in one of these lots earlier. But uh, Mather's himself died in 1811 and, he, and his widow, Sarah, kept a boarding house uh, there on Capitol Hill um, until uh, 1818. And uh, she paid taxes as owner of the building, but probably not the grounds. Um, then, uh, uh, let's see, back to that previous. This house over here where Claxton lived, uh, he is the uh, doorkeeper of the house. And he was uh, considered almost an honorary member of the Congress. He was so respected. Uh, he had been unanimously elected as doorkeeper. And he took responsibility for finding boarding houses for members that had not made their own arrangements. And so his, his wife kept a boarding house here and they got the members who hadn't, who hadn't found other places to live. So they, uh, they tended to be um, uh, last minute uh, boarders. Uh, we know that his household and effects were destroyed by the British in 1814. It probably was not this house. He must have moved somewhere else by that point. Uh, but he moved to successive uh, boarding houses down New Jersey Avenue, and he would keep up to 12 members of both parties. And his wife his also continued to pay boarders after his death in 1824. The, uh, the third uh, man, Thomas Dunn, the assistant doorkeeper of the house, we don't know that he ever actually lived on this, on this block, but he would have had the opportunity to do so. Uh, he'd been the assistant uh, doorkeeper in Philadelphia before they moved here. But when he moved here, he took a property on the riverfront at the foot of New Jersey Avenue, um, down where the Navy Yard is now. Uh, and we know he owned a house on 4th Street, on 1st on Street, where the Cannon Building is now. 
Um, but he died elsewhere. Uh, so these houses may have been investments. Uh, he may have stayed living um, down by the um, river. Uh, the stable um, was built on the east end because moving to Washington changed the nature of the officers of the Congress. Uh, they had been paid hourly and now they are being given a salary and they're considered to be on call 24 seven. And so they wanted them to have houses right here uh, so that the members could find them when they needed to. And all of these officers kept boarding houses uh, for at least 20 years here in Washington. These are some of the later owners that we could find records of. And uh, the list is on the right here. And these are the interesting characters I'm gonna be talking about. Samuel Blodgett is probably the most interesting. He was one of the people who arrived um, uh, in Washington with intent, intent to, I shouldn't even say arrived. He, he came here, because, but he uh, continued to live elsewhere. Uh, he was an investor and he bought a lot of lots. His father had been a speculator in Boston and had built Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, the father had arranged the canal around the falls of the Merrimack River, which made that uh, area of the first major industrial part of the United States. So they're very successful as developers in New Hampshire. And uh, so Junior comes here to Washington to do the same thing. Uh, he had served on George Washington's staff during the Revolution, and he uh, was, uh, had uh, a relationship with Thomas Jefferson, uh, and he, wanted, he had asked Jefferson to help him identify because he wanted to build an entire uh, block of a street in some prominent location, uh, but it was hard to tell from the maps that were available. So uh, uh, you may know that uh, L'Enfant was not able to get his map printed to his own satisfaction, and so it ended up that Andrew Ellicott actually printed the map that was used to, to sell lots. And um, uh, Samuel Blodgett is the one who arranged for the printing of Ellicott's map. Um, and so uh, he's doing this so that he can figure out where he wants to buy properties. And so he bought out one proprietor, Uriah Forrest. And uh, these are two different maps. The one on the left, the green one, is the map of the areas that different proprietors owned. And the one on the right is the one that was done at, uh, in 1870, somebody tracked uh, Samuel Blodgett and what he had, um, the lots that he had sold in Washington. And you can see the two coincide, the yellow arrows and the blue arrows uh, show the same locations. And so he has sold um, property in that area. So that's the area that he developed primarily, but that did not include this block that he wanted to develop. And just one side light, um, you see that uh, red triangle at the top of the, of the um, uh, map on the right, the estate map, that, was the, that actually fell outside uh, L'Enfant's plan. And that was the first area that was incorporated into Washington, and we know it today as Ledroit Park. And the reason for the boundaries of Ledroit Park, even today of that neighborhood, are that, that is the, that's the area that Samuel Blodgett owned. And we show you this just to show you how, how involved Samuel Blodgett was uh, in, in the, the uh, development of Washington. Now, this building is Blodgett's hotel, and the block that he selected to develop was 7th Street between E and F Northwest. And this is a drawing that was done at the time of it. Um, and here's the location of it. You can see I've put a little blue square there uh, where this hotel was. Uh, Blodgett's hotel was built with a lottery. This is the way uh, Samuel Blodgett carried, Jr. carried on and uh, was quite normal to do in that era. So you, you bought tickets and, and uh, somebody won the building um, after it got constructed. The person who actually won it was Robert Bickley of Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and he ended up with, with uh, uh, 14 lots that we know he sold in Washington from winning this, this and other lotteries. And that of those 14 blocks, 11 of them were on square 688, the one we're talking about. So that shows you the focus of development uh, and, uh, and how it got sort of directed. So Blodgett prom 
promoted several lotteries in several cities in the United States. That was uh, what he did. But the hotel failed. It failed and uh, was uh, purchased as an office building by the, by the government. Uh, and the, they moved the patent office and the post office both into this building. Uh, it was the largest building that was not burned in 1814. And William Thornton, who had been the architect of the Capitol and then a commissioner of the district, was by this point the commissioner of patents in 1814. And he claimed that he stood on the steps of this building and convinced the British not to burn it because America was already famous for the patents that were coming out of our, of our free society. And uh, the only records of those patents were the models that were inside here. And so the whole, whole of humankind was, gonna be de was going to be um, deprived of these wonderful inventions that Americans were doing if the British burned the building. And he claimed that he stopped the British from doing that. Uh, no one else has ever confirmed that, uh, but uh, he gets credit in history because nobody's contradicted it either. Uh, then after the fire, this was the only place that the Congress had to meet. So they met in Blodgett's Hotel, uh, but it was too small for continued use. And uh, it is now the site of the old, oldest post office in Washington, which is the Hotel Monaco on, um, on 7th Street. So that's the legacy of Samuel Blodgett who owned the lot in the upper left corner there, but probably never lived there. He probably, he may have built building or, or bought the lot at any rate for speculative purposes. Next, we're gonna talk about the one on the red arrow there, Buckner Thurston. Uh, we talked about him some weeks ago because he had a house up where the uh, Russell building is now. Uh, he's and uh, historically, he seems to be recorded as Thruston rather than Thurston. Uh, and the Congressional Bio Guide lists him, lists him that way, as does Wikipedia. Uh, but our DC sources all call him Thurston uh, rather than Thruston. And uh, so that's what we've gone with in the book. But it's the same guy. He was a senator from Kentucky, 1805 to 1809. And then he ran for mayor of Washington, DC, but he wasn't all that well liked. So he only got 10 votes. Um, then he was appointed judge in the DC circuit uh, and served there from 1810 to 1845 when he died. So 35 years on the court. And he probably served under William Cranch that we discussed a few weeks ago. That's Abigail Ab Adams' nephew who became the, who was a midnight judge appointed by uh, uh, John Adams. And then uh, Thomas Jefferson raised him to, to uh, uh, chief judge. And so probably Buckner Thurston worked under uh, William Cranch. Uh, Thurston was the judge for the famous trial of the journalist Anne Royal. Anne Royal was one of the first uh, woman journalists in Washington, and uh, she irritated enough people that there was a there was a um, a common charge that was made against uh, women who were too assertive. Uh, there was a crime called being a common scold, and uh, so so um, the, uh, Buckner Thurston was the was the judge in Anne Royal's trial for being a common scold. And she later wrote up her impressions of him, which were not very favorable. We know he, he owned lots on New Jersey Avenue Southeast as well, because he traded one of them for the Constitution Avenue lot where he finally built a house. Some weeks ago, we talked about Thomas Law and the fact that, that when Law retired from uh, activities here in Washington much, there was a big dinner given for Thomas Law uh, across the street in the Carroll Row. And uh, uh, Buckner Thurston was one of the co-chairs of that, of that dinner. That's one of the ways we know who was, who was important. But interesting character is the next one uh, at the Red Arrow there, Dr. Frederick May, who, who either bought or, or uh, rented this house uh, that uh, Buckner Thurston had had. He may have used the house as an office. Dr. May was the first physician uh, on Capitol Hill and was the only one practicing on Capitol Hill through this era. He had a contract to treat the workers at the Capitol and, uh, and this may have just been his office. He may not have lived here. Uh, he may have used it as a boarding house, but eventually he bought Thomas Law's house. And here it, here's Thomas Law's house, which was where the Cannon Building is now. This was one of the fanciest houses in Washington. And we know that Dr. May bought it and lived in it through most of this era. He bought it in 1818, which of course is after the uh, British had, had burned it. But this was one of the grandest uh, houses in town and Dr. May 
uh, lived there. Dr. May was also a real, real estate investor and was quoted in people's letters as promoting various properties on, uh, on Capitol Hill. He helped organize Christ Church, which was the uh, primary Episcopal church in Washington, uh, still exists uh, there on um, uh, 6th and is it G, Southeast. He was in, an investor in the Long Bridge, uh, which is now what we call the 14th Street Bridge, but he was one of the investors that, that uh, built that bridge when the government uh, wasn't doing the infrastructure that was necessary. And then he was involved in something called the Tontine Building Company. Now, this is a really weird idea that I had never come upon before, but apparently it was common in the era. I talked already about the, the lottery and the fact that you would buy buy tickets in the lottery and one person would end up end up owning the property. But they did the same thing, but in this case, you uh, uh, they didn't draw to see, but waited to see who the last person was. And as, as the owners died off, they lost their interest in the building. And so whoever lived the longest out of a tontine, uh, whoever lived the longest ended up with the building, uh, which is an interesting way of doing that. And I can see why we don't do that anymore. Uh, he was also involved in the, in the building of the old brick capital uh, that was done to keep the Congress from moving elsewhere. Uh, and he invested in Dowson's Row. Now, that's the, those are the, the buildings that were built after I showed you earlier where the British had burned uh, Daniel uh, Carroll of Duddington's buildings in Square 687. Uh, and and uh, Dr. May was one of those that bought the ruins and then built what they called Dowson's Row, and that became the permanent buildings that were on the north uh, side of, by the Senate there. He also was involved in this uh, dinner that was given for Thomas Law uh, as he retired. So Dr. May's finger seems to be in lots and lots of pies on Capitol Hill. The next person is Benjamin Burns. You can see I put the red arrow there. And uh, Burn, mo most of what we know about Burns is that he was a tailor. Uh, and of course, uh, this would be a lo good location for him. Uh, because the members of Congress were going to need suits and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And so uh, probably was used as a tailor shop. We don't know. He might have kept a boarding house as well. It's quite likely. Uh, but that's all we know about Benjamin Burns is he was a tailor and, and had this property. Uh, James Hickey, the one down below there, we don't know anything about him uh, except that, uh, that we know that he got this uh, property uh, in he had the property in 1811. Now, the blue arrow up here shows you the, this uh, one property that we know was transferred from William Dent to Daniel Dent in 1814. Now, the Dents are important. Uh, this is William, I'm sorry, I keep saying Dent, it's Brent. Uh, William Brent, um, this is a wonderful uh, uh, profile that was done of him by this French artist who came to Washington and did a lot of people's portraits. Um, William Brent was a business agent and lawyer. In 1796, he helped organize the Eastern Branch Bridge Company, which was the first uh, of the bridge companies that put them up. He was the treasurer, and Daniel Carroll of Duddington was the president. So this shows how close they were. They also were closely related. Uh, he was, that bridge had to be authorized by Prince George's County because Washington didn't even have a government yet. And uh, Prince George was still serving as the, as the local government. So they authorized the bridge, but then again, the bridge hadn't been finished by 1801. So the Congress had to authorize it again since they had taken over sovereignty of the area. Uh, that bridge was at Kentucky Avenue. And uh, uh, there are notices in the newspapers of Brent calling for the investors to pay for their shares. Apparently people. Uh, it, in fact, we know it was common in that era for people to take shares, but then not put up the money. And so uh, he would put out not notices in the newspaper that they needed the money to keep constructing on the bill, on the bridge. In 1814, the British burned that bridge, but not sufficiently to destroy it. So it was quickly restored. But finally, in 1846, uh, a steamboat going um, under the drawbridge uh, put out too many sparks and set the bridge aflame and it was destroyed in 1846 and never restored. So there's not been a bridge at Kentucky Avenue since 1846. Um, we know Brent owned, but did not live on Square 688. He lived on Delaware Avenue where the Russell Building is now. 
Uh, we know he sold lots on C Street Northeast uh, in that neighborhood in 1817 um, after the British burned because he sold one of them to the cashier of the Bank of Washington. So we know he's heavily involved in real estate. Uh, he was the secretary to Thomas Law. He was helping Law uh, administer his, um, his properties here. Law didn't spend very much of his time here. He'd go away for a year or more and, uh, and Brent was often in charge. Um, he was a Catholic, and he signed, he was one of the uh, of those who chartered for St. Peter's Church that's on the hill today. Uh, his wife, Catherine, is one of those who signed the petition when they lived on Delaware Avenue, uh, complaining to Thomas Law that he was building houses for lower class people uh, down the hill and uh, ruining their view because they had to look at them. You may remember that I talked about that. William Brent also invested in the old brick capital company, the Tontine Building Company that I was talking about, and the company that built Rockville Pike. Uh, they built a turnpike that went from Washington all the way to Frederick, and he was one of the investors in the part in, Mon in what is now Montgomery County. There's another Brent involved who, who did not have property here, Robert Brent, and we don't know what the relationship was between William and Robert, except that both of them married sisters uh, who were from the Carroll family. So uh, they were at least brothers-in-law by marriage uh, through their wives who were sisters. Robert Brent was the first mayor of Washington, uh, and he's the one who owned uh, or who ran on behalf of his family the Aquia Creek Quarry, where they got the stones for the Capitol and the White House. It may be that William Brent was, in, was uh, one of the owners of that as well, but we don't know that. Along with Daniel Carroll of Duddington, he, he uh, uh, helped organize the very first bridge that was constructed in Washington, D.C., which is the one that took Pennsylvania Avenue across Tiber Creek. That would be down about uh, uh, 6th or 7th Street uh, Northwest now. Uh, and Tiber Creek is still under there, but the first thing they had to do was build a bridge to get from uh, the White House to the Capitol. And, uh, uh, that was authorized again by Prince George's County because it was done before the government of Washington was even constituted. Uh, the other Brent that William Brent transferred the property to was Daniel Brent. And we know that Daniel Brent was a cousin of Duddington's, but we don't know what his relationship with William Brent is, but they're keeping that property in the family anyway. Daniel Brent was the U.S. Marshal uh, for the district, and he's the one that recruited Albert Gallatin to live in Sewell's house. Now, Sewell is a relative of both the Brents and the, and the Carrolls, so, so uh, Daniel Brent is helping uh, rent out his house, and Albert Gallatin, Secretary of the Treasury, then lived in that house for 12 years, the whole time that he was Secretary of the Treasury, and did a lot of entertaining there and helped make Capitol Hill uh, into a neighborhood. Uh, so we know that in 1814, this lot got transferred from William to Daniel Brent, and, but we don't know much else about it. That's 1814, of course, is right after the British burned the city, so it may be that William Brent was cutting back on his investments or had other interests or whatever. Now back here, we can go down to this square, and this is Peter Lennox. Lennox is a, uh, a name of developers in both New York and Boston, but we don't know anything about Peter, whether he was a member of the family that came here. We do know that John Coyle later had this house, uh, and um, John Coyle was a Scottish Mason who worked on the Capitol and the White House and helped organize the Presbyterian Church on South Capitol and B Street, uh, one of only five charter organize, organizers of that church. And here it is. Um, it was actually just across the street from Square 688, uh, and it was on the corner. Uh, uh, this is where the Longworth Building, this uh, uh, oddly shaped block is where the Longworth building is today. So on the corner where, nope, I've got that backwards. This is where uh, the Rayburn building is now. Uh, Delaware Avenue on the left there is completely gone and covered by the Rayburn building. But the corner uh, across the street from the Longworth building, which would have been off to the right on the map here, uh, is, is where this church was. And the Presbyterians or, uh, organized it. You can see the drawing there on the left and the first three um, windows there are uh, show you the size of the building when it was built, but it got so popular that they uh, that they added two more uh, bays on the on the building there. But eventually, that uh, uh, that building was sold to an African American a Methodist group 
but it was started by the Presbyterians, but then the Presbyterians decided, when they built a larger building, they decided to move elsewhere. So that is uh, John Coyle's involvement here. Um, oh, but we know that John Coyle kept a boarding house uh, in this, probably in this building here, uh, lot number seven, um, because later on, uh, he had a tenant, Senator William Plumer of New Hampshire lived there and complained about it. They crammed 16 members of Congress into this one house and they were all Federalists, but Plumer was a moderate fe Federalist and the others were not. This sounds like current politics today if you try to be a moderate in either party. Plumer couldn't bring guests to the house because the, the other members of Congress would make fun of them. And so the people he wanted to get acquainted with, he couldn't bring them to his property, to, to his boarding house, which was the normal thing to do. And so he had to meet with them elsewhere. So Plumer eventually switched to the Republican Party, which is what we now call the Democratic Party, uh, and served two terms as the, as the uh, Republican governor of New Hampshire. Now, we've already talked about James Mathers, who is, who is up here. Um, and um, we have Adam Lindsay in the corner here, and we don't know much about him, but he, he was the city council representative who lived, lived near the Navy Yard, so he probably had this, this property as an investment. Um, we don't know that there was actually a building there even, uh, but he could have had a boarding house or an investment property. And uh, he was one of the investors in the first 11th Street Bridge uh, in 1819. Uh, they built the bridge by the Navy Yard, um, and he was one of the investors there. Now we finally get to the guy that's really worth talking about, and that is William Coston. This is by far the most interesting person uh, involved in this block. I've talked about him briefly a couple of times in these lectures, but he is the one I learned the most about and I find the most fascinating in all of the uh, things that I've learned through, through creating Capitol Hill. William Coston was born enslaved uh, around 1780. We don't know for sure uh, when he was born. Um, and uh, he was um, Martha Washington's nephew. That is, her father, John Dandridge, also fathered Coston's mother. Uh, they didn't discuss that perfect publicly, of course, uh, but uh, uh, Coston is a Dandridge and related to Martha as her, um, as her nephew, although, again, that would not have been acknowledged at the time. Uh, Martha's son, Jackie Custis, is thought to have been his father. So um, he is also Martha's grandson, as well as her nephew. And uh, Jackie fathered uh, William Coston with this um, woman who had been, uh, who had been fathered by uh, his grandfather. Uh, so uh, lots of relationships going on in here, and William Coston is both a Dandridge and a Custis. Uh, he was enslaved to Martha Washington, and was among those that was to be freed by George Washington's will upon her death. Well, it dawned on them that these people were fixing Martha Washington's meals, and they had a vested interest in her death. They weren't going to be freed until she was dead, and so it was thought prudent to go ahead and free them uh, so, so that Martha's death would not be rushed. Um, and so they were freed. He was freed among these enslaved people in 1801. He becomes the bank night porter. He's a Capitol Hill property owner. He's a Capitol Hill builder. He's a West Indies trade investor, a church founder, and a school president. Just really a remarkable man. To understand him, we have to uh, learn about Oni Judge. Now, Oni Judge is famous, one of the most famous escaped slaves in history, and she was Coston's cousin. Uh, her father was an English indentured tailor at um, Mount Vernon, and he probably made George Washington's uniforms. Her mother was enslaved, and so she becomes also, but her father was European. She is Washington's famous escaped slave. She was born in 1773 and uh, was with the Washingtons in Philadelphia um, and one of their favorite um, house servants. When she learned that she was going to be given as a wedding present to Eliza Custis, when she married Thomas Law. Well, uh, 
Oni Judge disliked Eliza, and that became her reason to go ahead and escape, which she probably had been planning and hoping to do, as many of the enslaved people did when they lived in Philadelphia with the Congress. So rather than be sent to Washington, D.C. in 1795, she escaped, and she lived in New Hampshire all the rest of her life. There were regular attempts to, to get her to come back. Um, Washington would pay people to go to talk to her and so forth, but he knew that he dare not uh, uh, publicly attempt to capture her and bring her back because uh, this would ruin his reputation. And so she died a free person in New Hampshire in 1848. Oni had a sister named Delphi, who was uh, quite a bit younger. Delphi was the nickname for Philadelphia, so her name was Philadelphia Judge. Um, and in 1795, she was the one that got living, given to Eliza in place of Oni, who had escaped. Uh, and she worked at, at uh, uh, with the laws, probably in the Thomas Law House that still exists here on the waterfront in Washington, and certainly at that first house on New Jersey Avenue that I just showed you that uh, Dr. May had bought later. Um, in 1800, uh, William Coston married Delphi, who was his first cousin. So he is he's related to a lot of people along the way here. And um, uh, Eliza Custis had inherited 155 enslaved people uh, through the deaths of three different relatives. Uh, in 1802, um, she, uh, Eliza inherited 80 dower slaves from Martha uh, Washington, her grandmother, uh, through Jackie, uh, Eliza's father, who had died. And so the, the slaves had reverted to uh, Martha, and when Martha died, then uh, Eliza got them. And the judges were among those. Um, in 1804, her separation agreement from Thomas Law, their marriage didn't last all that long. Um, in, that, in the separation agreement, Thomas Law kept the, the uh, uh, Oni judge, I'm sorry, uh, Delphi judge, uh, and 15 other members of Costin's family and the related Holmes family. And in 1807, uh, he freed them all. So Thomas Law is the one who freed uh, Costin's wife and children. Costin is very pretentious. Uh, he named his children Park Costin uh, after the Park Custises uh, that were his family, uh, but uh, the, the uh, people that would not acknowledge his um, being their relative. So he's, he's trying to establish his own aristocracy uh, through his, and taking on the, the practices of the uh, aristocracy, uh, which is very uh, interesting. We know he was literate. He wrote out his own will in a beautiful hand, and uh, we don't know how he got to be literate, but it's quite possible that Thomas Law is the one who taught him because it sounds like something Thomas Law would do. Um, at any rate, he went to work as the night porter in the, in the bank. Uh, Daniel Carroll Duddington started the bank and he's the president, but uh, uh, this is what uh, Costin did consistently through these years. And you can see in the drawing, the building that's behind him is the bank. This is what he was most associated with. This drawing was done at the time of Costin's death. And this is the thing that everybody associated with him most was being at the bank. Um, the bank was just a half a block from Law's houses on New Jersey Avenue, so uh, it's quite possible that if, if uh, Oni Judge or Delphi Judge was still working with the Laws, um, that he didn't wa have to work walk very far. This portrait was paid for and published by the Capitol Hill businessmen to honor uh, William Coston because they respected him so much. His eulogy, which was published with this uh, um, drawing, uh, included the term, the words, millions of money were allowed to pass through his hands with no evidence of embezzlement. So this is what they, they honored him as an honest, uh, honest man. Uh, he was a real estate investor. Uh, he he uh, uh, built and, and owned houses that were used by freed and enslaved African Americans. Um, uh, we know there was a a uh, house on 4th Street South, uh, Northeast that had a free black family in it that he owned. He owned several houses near in near Northwest and Northeast. Uh, Thomas Law and probably Daniel Carroll had built houses in that area as well. Uh, that's where Carroll's relatives complained about Law building the houses. Um, 
and we know that Cawson owned some in that area. Uh, in 1820, he helped organize the Ebenezer Colored Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, one of the buildings of that church still stands on 4th Street Southeast, uh, but it's probably a much later building than, than he would have been involved with. In 1836, we know that he sold buildings on ground that he leased from Daniel Carroll, so he stayed in business relationship with Carroll through this whole period. Uh, and uh, those houses were in square 635, which is also part of where the Rayburn building is now on Capitol Hill. We know that he lived in the house on square 688. It's the one with the green arrow here. He lived in that house, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, uh, one of the more distinguished ones on the block. The Mathers, uh, the doorkeeper and sergeant at arms of the Senate would have lived uh, on one side or the other. I mean, we know later he lived on on uh, uh, his widow had the uh, boarding house there right next to it. And, uh, but the fact that William Coston owned, owned this property and lived there uh, so prominently is probably evidence that this block was no longer considered fashionable because it would be very unusual for an African American to be living uh, in, in what was a fashionable uh, white area. Coston made a will in 1833, which left the A Street house, that is this one, to his five daughters who were living in the house. Now he is known to have adopted several children, both related to him and not, uh, but he stipulated the daughters must not sell that house. The words he used, he wanted the house to descend from heir to heir forever. Now, if you know the concepts of law, that would be an entail. But uh, one of the things that happened right after the revolution was the abolishment of entails that, uh, that you could not uh, uh, forbid your heirs to sell uh, properties. And so of course it did not last, but he, it's just, what are you trying to do? This is an evidence of his aristocratic pretensions. He left two houses to his two sons up in Northeast with the same stipulation. And um, one of them was named uh, Custis Park Coston and the other one was named Calvert Park Cost Coston. So he's even including the Calverts as well as the Custises, and he would have been related to them, uh, to Calverts as well. So he's tying himself to these white families, these aristocratic families, uh, by naming his children with the same names. Uh, the the uh, properties that he owned were on at New Jersey and D Northeast, that's just one block uh, north of the houses that General Washington had built. Uh, that we talked about a few weeks ago, but that would have been, his houses would have been at the bottom of the steep hill and down by Tiber Creek. So uh, William Coston is the most prominent African-American citizen on Capitol Hill. We know he did business deals with Thomas Law, that the white businessmen uh, um, were served as trustees of the, of the deals that he made and, and uh, for his properties. We know he was in the Caribbean trade business and in, we also know that in 1820, he purchased at least one enslaved man and freed him. And he was involved in purchasing other relatives from George Washington Park Custis, who would have owned uh, the rest of his family. And that at one point, he successfully sued uh, to stop a requirement that was being put on to require a bond and a written references from white people in order for, um, black residents, even long-term ones. And he won the case, but did not manage to get the whole thing um, uh, turned over as constitution, unconstitutional. He started the first school for African-American children for his own children who were not allowed to go uh, to the other schools in town. So he starts one for his own children, natural and adopted. And it was in this A Street house that we're talking about. In, in 1818, they actually chartered a, what was called the Resolute Beneficial Society, which was uh, to uh, continue uh, to provide education for African-American children. In 1825, he helped charter the Columbian Harmony Cemetery so that black people would have uh, a place to be buried. This was in the location that is now the Rhode Island Avenue Metro Station, and eventually the graveyard and the bodies were moved out into Prince George's County. Um, and he started the first African-American Masonic temple. So this is this, is, this, is this wonderful man who, who uh, is a towering figure amongst uh, all the 
all the uh, other people that we've talked about today. Jane, I'm ready for questions. Great, Steve. Well, we got a pile coming in. Um, and I think we'll start with our, our distinguished board member, Ken Bowling. And he was trying to figure out, was Costin owned by George Washington or was he owned by the Curtis estate? Well, he, 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 was a, he was a Custis. And so he would have been amongst the Custis slaves. He was not a slave. He was not one of George Washington's slaves, but George Washington had responsibility for the Custis slaves that Martha owned. Got it, got it. Um, okay, then a couple questions. Um, maybe one quick follow-up is, do you have anything that you would recommend if people really find this, uh, Mr. Custon, so fascinating? Is there anything beyond creating Capitol Hill that you think people might want to read if they were going to go for more information? I am not aware of anything. I had asked a couple of people and nobody seems to know uh, in particular, although Costin was is well known amongst the African American historians of Washington, but I'm not I'm not aware of what the um, uh, what the uh, written materials are about it. Of course, Pam Scott is the one who did all of the of the research that I talk about. Great. Um, now we got a couple questions about the doorkeepers, um, and so we'll put the two of them together. One is. What were the responsibilities of the doorkeepers at that time? And uh, you indicated that these doorkeepers got housing as part of their arrangement. Do you know when it changed that now doorkeepers are on their own? Well, for one thing, the, the doorkeeper job has been abolished uh, and combined with the sergeant at arms now. But when I started working in the Congress, there was a separate door, doorkeeper. And, and in fact, uh, the famous one was the one named Fishbait Miller. Uh, and, uh, and the doorkeeper was the person that we know that stands uh, and says, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. Uh, now, all of the, all of the, the um, uh, guards that are stationed all the way around the, uh, the two um, uh, chambers still are called doorkeepers and they're the ones that stand there and keep people from going through the doors if they're not supposed to. Uh, so that was the first thing, but they also uh, uh, had a lot of the functions of the architect of the Capitol and, and so forth. So, so it was a big job. Uh, and the Sergeant at Arms um, was responsible for order and sort of uh, what a, um, uh, perhaps a, a guard would do, but the but the doorkeeper had the responsibility, for instance, of, of telling the members when the meetings were and, uh, and sending out um, uh, messengers to the houses, because of course there was no telephone, you couldn't call them up. And so uh, when they moved to Washington, the members of Congress uh, were living all over, some of them in Georgetown, and so they would have to have messengers to go all the way to Georgetown to get them to, to come. That's why those flags fly on the cap top of the Capitol today when the Congress is in session, because back then that was the way the members knew that they were supposed to be there. If the flag was up, they were supposed to be there. And so that was the job of the doorkeeper. It was, it was in many ways uh, much more important than the, than the uh, sergeant at arms. Got it. Um, now, question about this. You, you sort of slipped over um, that there was a unique charge that could only be brought against women um, as a common scold for a woman being particularly assertive. Can you tell us a little more about that? Um, I have not actually read too much about it to, to detail it. And I don't know for sure that that was reserved for women, uh, most likely. Uh, but uh, it could be that a man could be called a common scold too, but I've not uh, been involved with the research on it. But of course, men were often charged with being vagrants and that sort of thing. And, and when I came to Washington, these, these were still real uh, charges that could be made. I don't know that they had actually prosecuted anybody as a common scold. Recently, I'd be interested to find out that's something we ought to uh, research for fun if somebody wants to. But um, uh, that was sort of what was left over from charging women as being witches. Um, if, if women were too assertive, uh, they, could be, they could be charged with that just as a man if he was, uh, if he was um, uh, not working and earning his way could be 
could be charged with being a vagrant. Got it. And as you're talking about square 688, um, how are the squares in DC numbered? I mean, how did we get 688? Where did that, do you know where that came from? Oh yes, that, that's the L'Enfant plan. He, la he laid them out and numbered each one of them. And they're, they're numbered in order from uh, the first uh, uh, stone for the city was set, uh, I believe at P Street and Rock Creek Park uh, and Rock Creek. Uh, and I think that stone is still there. Um, and then uh, I believe they were numbered from that point, although I've never checked that out. But at any rate, they go from west to east and from north to south. Got it. And the final question, um, you spoke about the, the marble. Uh, where was the Aquia Creek Quarry? Quarry, quarry. Actually, you can go and see it yourself today. It is a county park in Stafford County, Virginia. Uh, it's about 45 miles down um, uh, Interstate 95 uh, to Aquia, Virginia. And, uh, and if you get off there, you're gonna come to the Aquia Church and then uh, something called Government Island County Park. And that's where, the, the, uh, quar that's where this sandstone came from. And that was owned by the Brents and the Brents didn't want to run the, run the quarry. So the government had to buy it from them. But um, uh, the quarry is still down there. Uh, the stone is such of such poor quality that nobody would buy it after the Capitol and the White House were built. And so the stone is still there. You can see the quarry uh, sort of as it was used. It's a wonderful little park down there. I've been down there several times. Well, Steve, you never fail to amaze uh, with your depth of knowledge and the uh, warm, warm way in which you describe historical figures. They all come to life in, in, in your words. And so we are so grateful to have you part of our team. Um, all right, everybody have a great day. Uh, stay cool and we'll see you next week. Thanks, bye.